Okay, hope you enjoyed the guitar introduction. That's a little bit of a song called Endless Road <clears throat> from a my personal favorite acoustic guitar player, Tommy Emmanuel. All right, uh, so what we're going to look at in the second part of this video is mostly algebraic techniques now. <clears throat> so we're going to look at rational functions, or we're going to look at a limit of a rational function with a form 0, 0. So uh, the first thing that you want to do <clears throat> is always, when you're doing a rational function, just um, plug in the number and see what happens. So let's go ahead and do that. So kind of your step one, plug in the one. You got one to the second minus one, and then you've got one minus one. So that's equal to one minus one over one minus one. So that's a zero over zero indetermined form. Yeah, it is undefined, but when you come up with zero over zero, that does not necessarily mean that the limit will not exist. It means it might exist. So what we're going to do is we're going to do some algebra. And you can notice on this, this is a difference of two squares, so we're going to factor that numerator. So we're going to have limit, <clears throat> x goes to 1, uh, factor the numerator, uh, those are perfect squares, so we have x times x to get x squared, 1 times 1 to get 1, and then a plus and minus. So you've got to be totally on top of how to do your factoring. All right, then I just bring down the x minus 1. So what happens is these will divide out. That's really 1. You know, a, a lot of times students and teachers will say cancels out. I prefer to use the terminology, you're removing a factor of 1. That thing is equal to 1, so as a result, you just are left with x plus 1. I, like, I prefer that rather than canceling. So we have the limit x goes to 1 of x plus 1 is what's left over. Now I can plug in the 1. 1 plus 1 gives 2. So it appears that the answer to that limit does exist, and it's equal to 2. Okay, <clears throat> so... What I'm going to do is we're going to look at the graphing calculator, and you don't have to use the calculator. This is just a way to help you understand what's going on in the problem. So I'm going to graph this in the original form, the non-factored form, and I'll put this in like this. And I'll just do a standard window, and we'll see what this looks like. And it's going to look like a line, which might be a little surprising to you, but that's not really... Shouldn't be that surprising because what we're left with is x plus 1. And if you were to graph y equals x plus 1, that has a y-intercept of 1 and it has a slope of 1. Okay, That's your y-intercept. Then your slope is the number in front of x, which is 1 over 1. So you would just go up 1 over 1, up 1 over 1, and so forth. And then you would have what your line looks like. <clears throat> So, um, now there's a couple of things that I want to make sure you understand. When we graph this line, uh, let me get that lined up there like that, there's one little detail of this. And this function is undefined at x equals 1. So we are undefined if x is equal to 1. You can tell by looking at the denominator. Okay, another way to look at this on the calculator is Look at your table by going second graph, and you're going to see there's an error at 1. Now, what that means is it means there's a hole right there. Everywhere else it's defined, but if x is equal to 3, we get a hole. Uh, or, I'm sorry, x equals uh, 1. I don't know why I did that. x equals 1 is where we're undefined. So we have the hole right here. So I'm going to just erase that. And then I'm going to put a little bubble there. So technically, that's how the graph looks like. That's where your hole is. And if you look at this, you know, if you go back to looking at the way we learned how to do limits with a calculator, since we're looking at x approaches 1, look what happens if I trace just a little bit bigger than 1, like a little bit to the right of 1. Well, I'm close to 2. Okay, so that verifies the answer. If we're a little bit less than 1, say like 0.999, trace it 1, well, that's what we get. We're close to 2. So again, you can pretty well tell that you're correct on these things. All right? 
Okay, so the next one is another rational function, and this one has a little trick to it, and the factoring's a little bit harder for students on this one. So again, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start off by uh, plugging in the 2. So if I do that, I get 3 times 2 to the second minus 7 times 2 plus 2. And then if I subtract, I'm going to get 3 times 4 minus 14 plus 2 over 0. And then that's 12 minus 14 plus 2 over 0. So that looks like that is, again, 0 over 0. So again, this is an indeterminate form. And if that happens, it does not mean that the limit has, will not exist. It may, but it may exist as well. So what you do is you go ahead and do factoring. Okay, now I'm going to go over the side and just kind of use a review <coughs> on this. You know, generally, students learn how to do this in a lot of different ways. There's factor by grouping, a lot of different techniques that teachers teach. I usually just kind of do a trial and error if these numbers are pretty small. So this first term, the only possibilities are 3t and t. And that's nice. There's only two things can happen. Uh, same thing on the last term. It's either 1 times 2 or it's 2 times 1. And what I do is I just pick an order and I put it in. So if I do 2 times 1, now what I'm going to do is look at the inner term, which is going to be 2t. The outer term is going to be 3t. And we want that to add up to negative 7t. And there isn't any way to do that because that's negative 5t. So that's the wrong approach. So what I do is I just switch the order now. Okay, so I'm going to do 3t and 3t and 3t and t, but this time instead of going 2 and 1, I'm going to go 1 and 2. Then I'll start over again. So that inner term is 1t. This outer term, 2 times 3 is 6t, and we want that to add up to negative 7t. So the way we can do that is by just having two negatives there. Okay, so that's all that factors, 3t minus 1, t minus 2. All right, so I'm going to go to my second step, and we're just going to factor that numerator. So that is going to be 3t minus 1 times t minus 2. <clears throat> and then I'm going to go uh, just write down the t minus 2. All right, now something's really important on this, and you have to look at these two factors, and these things are not the same. They are not equal to 1. You can't remove those factors unless you do this. So one thing I want you to notice is we can turn one of them around, and before I do that, I just want to mention that, okay, if you subtract two numbers backwards, what always happens is um, you get the opposite answer. 3 minus 1 is 2, 1 minus 3 is negative 2. So you're, these things have an opposite value. Actually, it's equal to negative 1. Okay, so what you can do is you can cross that out and replace that with negative 1 if you want to. Or you can do like this. This is what I usually like to do is just turn one of them around. So 2, two minus t is the same thing as t minus 2 times negative 1. And you have to understand why that's right. If you distribute this, see that gives negative 1t plus 2. Well, that's still 2 minus t, see? So they're, so they're the same. So what I'm going to do, you can either just cross it out and replace it with negative 1, or you can show the step like this. So I'm just going to leave the numerator as it is. And then the denominator, I'm going to change that to t minus 2. But I'm going to, when I do that, I need to multiply that by negative 1. Now those things cross out, so I'm left with the limit as t approaches 2 of 3t minus 1 over negative 1. Then I can plug in the 2 and get my answer to my limit. So plug in the 2. That's 3 times 2 minus 1 over negative 1. So that's 6 minus 1 over negative 1. 5 over negative 1 leaves you with a value of negative 5. Okay, so that is something that you encounter every now and then. And that's an, an algebra concept that you want to review and make sure that you 
know how to handle the backwards subtraction factors. All right, let's see if this is right. So I'm going to uh, get my calculator out. Let's put in the numerator, 3x squared <clears throat> minus 7x plus 2. Notice I'm putting that in parentheses. Always do that with rational functions. And I've got t minus, uh, 2 minus x. And then I'm going to go zoom 6, just a standard window. And it looks like we get a line again. And what happened on this is we, were, we ended up with this, really. And this is really the same thing as negative 3t plus 1. So this is what this line is. All right. So and what I'm doing on this, I'm just dividing both terms by negative 1. So I get negative 3 and then plus 1 like that. So the y-intercept is 1. You have a slope of down 3 over 1. So I go 1, 2, 3 down over 1, 1, 2, 3 down over 1. And uh, that's what the graph of this is going to look like. It's going to be the same line then. Okay, now you got a hole in this graph though. So again, what happens if you look at your table of values, uh, notice it too, there's an error. So what you're going to find on here is you got this bubble right here. That is uh, undefined right there. So you actually have a bubble like that. So that's what your graph looks like. And again, you can easily verify this. We're doing the limit as x goes to 2. So if I trace at a number just a little bit bigger than 2, well, look what happens. Okay, we're close to negative 5. If I trace at a number a little lower than 2, coming from the left-hand side, that is also going to be negative 5, getting close to it. All right, so again, you can verify these limits, but you want to know how to do things algebraically. You don't want to just totally rely on the calculator. You want to use the calculator to help you understand the concept of what a limit is. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to move to this next piece here. Then I'm going to let you pause the video and try these two problems right here. Okay, as soon as you're finished, resume the video, and then you can check and see if you're correct. Okay, let's take a look and see how we did. And these are, <coughs> excuse me, 100% uh, verifiable on the calculator, like I've been showing you. So problem one, you would have got four. Problem two, negative eight. Uh, this is a zero over zero form. Both of these are. You can see how I verified the arithmetic. Um, <clears throat> you can bypass that step one. It's just a good idea to see that it's zero over zero. Uh, if you do see that uh, you can go ahead and factor, you can go ahead and jump in and do it that way. So I factored this, uh, removed the factor of 1, x minus 3 over x minus 3, and then ultimately I was left with y equals x plus 1. So when I plug in the 3, I got 3 plus 1 is 4. And really the graph is the graph of the line y equals x plus 1. It's got a y-intercept of 1, a slope of 1, and when x is 3, there is a hole in it. Okay, so that's what the graph would look like uh, on your calculator. And again, what I did on here is like if you graph this, and if you trace at a number very close to 3, you get a number very close to 4. All right, number 2 is probably a little harder because of the factoring. The numerator is a difference of two squares. So I went ahead and just factored it as 4 and 4, x and x with a plus minus brought down the x minus 4, then I chose to turn this, the bottom one around. It doesn't matter. You can turn the other one around, or you can just cross it out and say, okay, that's really just negative 1. So you're left with y equals negative 1 times 4 plus x, which is negative 4 minus x. Okay, so after you turn that around, they cancel, so you're left with 4 plus x over negative 1. And then you can plug the 4 in. You get 4 plus 1 over negative 1. 8 over negative 1 is negative 8. And then the graph would look like this. It would actually be the graph of y equals negative x minus 4, with your y-intercept being negative 4. 
and then your slope is down one over one. That's the number in front of X. <clears throat> okay, so that's how that goes, and then you can um, check that on your calculator. Okay, so you can pause if you need to, if you need to look at anything, correct anything. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next topic, which is what we do when we have to deal with conjugates, so a different type of a fractional expression. <clears throat> okay, I'll erase some of this. Okay, so let's take a look at this situation next. So uh, we're going to look at this particular limit. I went ahead and wrote down the steps, so you don't have to necessarily write those out, but we are going to finish this up. <clears throat> so the conjugate just means, first of all, you have a binomial. A binomial just means you have two terms. You have x plus a or you have x minus a. The conjugate is the same thing except the sign is the opposite. So the conjugate of x plus a is x minus a. The conjugate of x minus a is x plus a. So it's kind of important when you have square roots uh, that you know how to work with a conjugate and you know how to foil with your radicals and everything. So the thing on this is if you plug in the 9 on this very first problem, so you're going to get, when you plug in 9, you would have square root of 9 minus 3 over 9 minus 9. So see, that's 3 minus 3 over 9 minus 9. So again, that's a 0 over 0 form. Okay, you can tell by looking at that. So again, if it's 0 over 0 form, it means the limit May or, may or may not exist. In this case, it's going to exist. Most cases, we're going to look at 0 over 0 form uh, are going to have a limit. So the conjugate, you want to do the conjugate not of the x minus 9, but of the root. So notice that what I'm doing is the conjugate of square root of x minus 3 is square root of x plus 3 over square root of x plus 3. And I have to do the multiply the numerator and denominator by the same thing. That way I don't change the value of the expression. So what I did in this next step, and see this is FOIL. So I'm doing the first term. Square root of x times square root of x is square root of x squared. The outside term is root x times positive 3 is positive 3 root x. The inside term is negative 3 root x. And then the last term you have is negative 3 times 3 is negative 9. Okay, and then notice the denominator. I don't do anything with the denominator. You do not want to multiply that out. Just bring it down. Okay, now notice what happens is those terms cancel out. That's what will happen on a conjugate when you're dealing with square roots. So let's go ahead and finish this up now. So the next step we're going to have limit x goes to 9. The square root of x squared is just what do you multiply by itself to get x squared? It's x. So that will become x minus 9. And then the denominator, I'm just going to bring it down. And then what's going to happen is we have a factor that's going to, that we can take out. That's really 1. That whole thing right there is 1. So what we end up with is we end up with the limit x goes to 9 of 1 over square root of x plus 3. And a lot of times I see students cancel that out, and then they think that this is left over. That's not right. It's 1 over square root of x plus 3. So be careful about that. Remember, that is a 1 over 1. Sometimes students will, you know, I say just put 1 over 1 there when you divide that out. Okay, now what we can do is plug in the 9 to get our answer to our limit. So that's 1 over square root of 9 plus 3. So that's 1 over 3 plus 3. So that limit has a value of 1 sixth. So the answer to that uh, limit is going to be 1 over 6. Okay, so that's how you handle a conjugate. And again, we're going to verify this on our graphing calculator, like we've been doing. Um, so I'm going to put in the numerator in parentheses. We have square root of x and then minus 3. Divide by and then x minus 9. Uh, 
Okay, I'll do a zoom six. Uh, I may have to kind of play with the window on this one a little bit. So make sure, yeah, I got that put in right. I'm gonna change the window. We're interested in the limit as X goes to nine. So I'm gonna go like zero to 20. That probably makes a little bit better sense if I do something like that. Or let's just go zero to 15 by a scale of one. And for the denominator, um, let's go through and do like um, negative one to one. Uh, oops, oh, crap. I keep putting the wrong thing in. That should be a scale of one, y min negative one, x max, y max one. Let's see what that looks like. Okay, yeah, that's kind of a nice graph. And the thing is, we're interested in the limit as x goes to nine. So if I was to trace at a number real close to nine, like say 8.999, then we're close to this decimal value, but that decimal is the same as one sixth. Okay, so what I'm gonna do on this is, um, you're going to be undefined at nine again. So if you just wanna go through and just sketch a graph, you know, when you're at, when you're way out here at nine, you're just, you're at, a, at one sixth, you have a bubble and this graph is kind of doing something like this. Um, if you go to your table of values, um, you know, you're gonna see kind of small numbers on this. So it basically just kind of does something kind of like this. It's not a line, it is a curve, but that's, you know, good enough for what we're going to do. Um, so I've verified again uh, by tracing that that's the right answer, okay? So I'm gonna put this, um, slide this over here and show you one other thing on here. So our answer is one sixth. So notice if I take one sixth on my calculator, I get, I get these same decimals, All right? So you can basically see that if you do that calculation, then you can pretty well verify that you have done that correctly then, okay? All right, so that's how you work with a conjugate. I'm gonna talk through one more example. Uh, so I'm gonna go on to the next page, this example 5b, and again, we're gonna work with a conjugate and finish this one up. So what I did on here is the conjugate of x minus a is x plus a. So I did this. I factored x squared minus a squared. So that's a difference of two squares. So I'm going to do that. Now, what I'm going to do on this now is I'm going to foil out the bottom. See, this numerator, I'm going to keep all those factors as they are. I don't want to multiply those out. But when I do the denominator, I have square root of x squared is the first term, plus square root of x times square root of a. The inside term is negative a times square root of x, and then the last term is negative square root of a times square root of a, so it's negative square root of a squared. So those will go to zero, and then let's write what we're left with. So in the next step, we'll have the limit as x goes to a. The numerator, I'm not gonna do anything with that, that's x plus a, x minus a, whoops, x minus a, and then bring down the square root of x plus the square root of a. And in the denominator, the square root of x squared is x, square root of a squared is a, so we have that. And then what'll happen is you can remove this factor of one right there, and then we just plug in what we're left with. So we have the limit, x comes to a, x approaches a, two-sided limit, and we're left with x plus a times square root of x plus square root of a. So now everywhere I see an x, I'm gonna plug in an a. So this is going to be a plus a times the square root of a plus the square root of a. Okay, so that is 2a, a plus a is 2a. And these are like terms, so a plus, root a plus root a is two root a. So you would get as your final answer, two times two is four a, times the square root of a. That's kind of an interesting answer. So that is the solution of that problem. 
so you're going to get into a little bit of algebra that goes on here. You want to be really very good with FOIL and multiplying with radicals and understand how to work with conjugates well. Okay, so you can pause if you need to review this. I'm going to move on and uh, look at have you tried two problems with conjugates. So I'm going to go ahead and move down here and then let you go ahead and start on these two problems, okay? When you're done, resume the video and see how you did. Okay, so let me show you what the answers are. Number one, I kind of wasn't really trying to trick you. I just wanted to see what you came up with on this. And technically, the answer is does not exist. First of all, if you overlooked plugging this in, so like the first thing you do, if you plug the 4 into the limit, you would have 4 squared minus 4 over square root of 4 minus 2. Well, that's 16 minus 4 over 2 minus 2. That's 12 over 0. So that is not a 0 over 0 form. All right. So what happens in that case is um, these techniques probably aren't going to get you anywhere. You're not going to get a, a valid answer. Now, what I went ahead and did on here, though, is I factored x squared minus 4. That's my uh, difference of two squares. The conjugate of the denominator, square root of x plus 2 over square root of x plus 2. All right, so you can kind of look at how I multiplied out. See, when you, multi when you foil the bottom, you don't even have to write, you know, these uh, two terms. You just need to know that they always cancel out. So you're really doing the first term minus the last term like that. And what happens is you, don't, you end up with nothing that cancels out. All right, so if you plug the 4 in now, everywhere you see an x, you plug in a 4. Well, you're going to get 48 over 0. You get 6 times 2, which is 12, times 4 is 48. So it's undefined. So this limit does not exist. All right. A little bit later um, in the class, when we, we're going to move to where we start looking at uh, infinite limits and limits uh, around a vertical asymptote, we'll look at it a little differently. In this case, this one does not exist. Okay. And I think it's worth showing on this. I didn't um, do this, uh, but I'm going to do this now. So if I put in uh, x squared minus 4 divided by square root of x minus 2, let's take a look at this just in a standard window and see what happens. That's kind of an interesting looking graph. Well, if you, if you go like this uh, at x equals... Four, you have an error. Uh, what's going to happen on this, and it's kind of hard to see on here, if I trace at a number pretty close to four, I'm getting this number that's like way down there. Uh, you know, it's like it's going way down there. And the thing that's going to happen is if I trace closer, closer, and closer to four, that number just gets further and further down. Okay, so what happens on, on this problem is that things actually go into negative infinity. And there is um, something else on this, too. My graph is not showing that. But once we get beyond 4, we start getting these big positive numbers. So if I changed my window, it'd probably be better if I just did something like negative 5 to 5. And then for my y's, I go negative 100 to 100. By 10, okay, then just look at what this is then. So basically, the graph is going down that way, but then it's going up that way. So they're going into different directions. One of them's really going to negative infinity. The other one's going to positive infinity. So it doesn't exist, okay? All right, and uh, let's see. So the second problem, um, it is a 0 over 0 limit. You can see that I plugged in the negative 1, verified 0 over 0. The conjugate of the numerator is square root of x plus 2 plus 1. So I multiplied by the conjugate. Okay, foil the numerator, you get square root of x plus 2 squared plus 1 square root of x plus 2. I think I didn't put my minus in there. And then those cancel out. So you can see how that goes. I ended up ultimately with this. 
those things you can remove. So I'm, I end up with this expression. Then I can plug in the negative 1 to get 1 over square root of negative 1 plus 2 plus 1. That ends up being 1 half. So the answer that's 1 half. So the algebra is a little bit heavier on conjugates. So those are things usually students have to work on a little bit. Depends on your algebra background. Okay, so we'll kind of move on from this point. So pause the video if you need to. Okay, so we're going to look at what we call a complex fraction and look at how uh, this works out then. Okay, so first of all, what happens on this, if we just evaluate, plug a 1 in everywhere you see an x, you're going to get 1 over 1 plus 1 minus 1 over 2 all over 1 minus 1. So this gives a half minus a half over 0. So you get 0 over 0 form. So there's a good chance that this limit exists. So what happens on a complex fraction is you, you have a fraction inside of a fraction. You would like that 2, that denominator 2, to go away. You would also like the x plus 1 to go away. So what you do is you multiply the numerator by 2 times x plus 1, and then you have to multiply the denominator by that as well. So this is how you handle what we call a complex fraction. All right, so first thing I want to do is just write the problem down. And we're going to, I'm going to draw like parentheses around top and bottom. The top is going to be multiplied by 2 x plus 1, and so is the bottom. Okay, now you can learn to, to do this in your head and process it in your head, okay. I'm going to do a distributive property. I'm going to take it times that, and I'm going to take it times that. So this will end up giving me the limit as x goes to 1 of 1 over x plus 1 times 2 times x plus 1. And then I go back, I've got minus 1 half. And then that's also going to be multiplied by 2 times x plus 1. And then the denominator is just uh, x minus 1 times 2 times x plus 1, like that. So what's going to happen is these things are going to cancel out. Okay, so that, I'm going to remove that and remove that and then remove the 2s. And then I'm going to write what I'm left with. So I'm left with the limit as x goes to 1. This whole thing right here is 2. This whole thing here is minus 1 times x plus 1. Then the denominator, I'm going to leave it factored. You don't want to uh, multiply that out because you want to see if you can get something to cancel anyway. Okay, so it'll go like that. Okay, and then we'll see what we're left with. So we have limit x goes to 1, 2 minus x minus 1 over x minus 1 times 2 times x plus 1. All right, and that's going to be the limit uh, as x goes to 1. Uh, and that will be 1, um, one minus x over x minus 1 times 2 times x plus 1. And what I want you to notice on this is you have that backwards factor thing again. So what I'm going to do this time is I'm going to uh, turn the top one around. So I've got the limit. x goes to 1. I'm going to change this numerator to negative 1 times x minus 1. Then just leave the denominator as it is, as, as you're doing the problem. Then what happens is you're going to have this can be removed. And then you can go ahead and evaluate this then. So I'm going to have, um, looks like I'll have the limit. x approaches 1 of negative 1 over 2 times x plus 1. Now I can plug in the 1. So I have negative 1 over 2 times 1 plus 1. That's negative 1 over 2 times 2. So that's negative 1 fourth. Okay? And I'm kind of going through that kind of quickly. But you can, 
you know, pause the video and look at that real carefully and what I'm doing. The idea is you want to get rid of these denominators so that your fraction, you have a, what we call a simple fraction. And ultimately, that's what we had right here. After we did this, this is a simple fraction. There's not fractions inside of fractions. Okay, so that would be the answer to that problem would be negative one-fourth. Okay, I'm not going to bother graphing in that or anything. That limit does exist on that one. Okay, so if you would like to go ahead and pause the video, you may do that. And um, we're going to look at problem number one at the bottom. Just one example of these. Okay, so here is the answer. The answer that you should have got was negative 1 over a squared. So you want to look over this and um, let's see what I did. The, there's, the first thing I went ahead and did was plugged in the zero. So it, I, I'm going to replace the H's with zero. I ended up getting zero over zero. So you want to look over the details on that. And then what happens is these are the things I'm wanting to get rid of. I want to get rid of those two denominators so I multiply by a times a plus h, all right? And what happens is, see, I'm doing a distributive property. So I have 1 over a plus h times a times a plus h. Bring down the minus 1 over a, and then that also gets multiplied by a times a plus h. You can learn to do this in your head, but if you're not there, then just write this step down very carefully like I did here and then do the cancellation. So these will uh, divide out. You can remove that factor of 1. So 1 times a is a. a is divided out here, so you're left with negative a plus h. The denominator, I just I don't multiply it out. That's kind of a common theme here. I just keep bringing that down. Then I've got a minus a minus h. Okay, a minus a is 0. 0 minus h is negative h. Uh, you can uh, remove the factor h over h. Okay, that divides out, uh, removing a factor of 1, I like to say. So that's negative 1 over a times a plus h. Now you can plug in the, the h goes to 0. Negative 1 over a times a is negative 1 over a squared. All right, so that's how that works then. All right, so i um, going to look at one more thing on this second part here. All right, so pause your video if you need to look over that more carefully. Otherwise, I'm going to move on to the page 10, and we're going to do one problem. Uh, I took this one out of a web work type thing here. So we're just going to work this out to finish up part two of this video. All right, so since we talked about limit laws in this section, you're given two graphs. This is the graph uh, f of x is the one in blue. Uh, no, no, um, and then g is the one that's in red. So this is f of x over here. And then g of x is the one that's in red. All right, so we have graphs. So we're going to do these things here. So if we do the sum law, um, I guess these are basically the same problem, except the limits are approaching different numbers. Well, on problem number one, this would be the same thing as the limit as x goes to 1 of f of x plus the limit x goes to 1 of g of x. Now, what we got to do is we got to get this information from the graph. So if x is approaching 1, okay, just look at the graph. Um, from the left-hand side, it looks like that's approaching 1. From the right-hand side, that looks like it's also approaching 1. So the value of this limit is 1. Okay, now we look at g of x. Oops, hold on. Doing the wrong thing there. I'm doing that backwards. That's what g of x was. Okay, now limit of f of x. This is f of x. So look what happens here. Okay, I'm interested as the limit goes to 1. So if I come from the left, I'm going to that y value. If I come from the right, I'm going there. So that doesn't exist. So you could not do get an answer on this problem. So the limit would not exist on that particular problem. Okay, now we're going to look at the second one as well. So what you're doing is you're 
breaking these up using the limit laws, and then you're getting the information on the limit just by looking at your graph. Okay, let me erase what I wrote on there. Let's look at the next one. So we're going to do the sum law again on this one. So this one is limit this time x approaches 2 of f of x plus the limit x approaches 2 of g of x. Okay, so when we do the limit of f of x, now we're interested at 2, which is here. Okay, so as we close in on 2, this y value is getting close to 2. And if we come from the right, see, we're approaching that y value of 2. So the limit of f of x as x approaches 2 is 2. Okay, now we go to g of x. Here's 2. We're going to do the same thing. Left-hand limit, we're getting close to 0. Right-hand limit, same place, getting close to 0. So 2 plus 0 is equal to 2. All right, so you're using the limit laws, but you're getting the value of the limit from the graph. Okay, we've already kind of looked at how you do, um, can look at a graph and interpret what its limit is. Okay, the third one, you can use the, um, the product law. So you would write this as the limit x goes to 0 of f of x times the limit x goes to 0 of g of x. Okay, so if we do the limit of f of x, so here's f of x, the one in blue, Here's x equals 0. Well, so it looks like if we come from the left, it's kind of hard to tell what that is. Whoops. Yeah, it's kind of hard to tell what that is. I'm just going to estimate that maybe as 1.6. And if I come from the right, it's coming to the same place. So let's just estimate that at about 1.6. Okay. Now we'll do g of x, which is the one in uh, red. So if, if x is equal to 0, if we come from the left, as we approach x equals 0, y is getting close to 0. The right-hand limit is also approaching 0, so we have that. So the answer is 0. Okay? So you want to look over how to do that type of thing. It's basically a summary of what we did with limit laws, but also being able to tell what the limit of a graph is. Okay? All right, so that will be the end of this part of the video. The third part will be what we call the squeezing theorem. So I hope you enjoyed the video and learned a lot from this. This will help you get good with your